All right, gang, um, we're going to kick off. Peter, um, I want to ask the, you know, I want to go where we kicked off, which is about um, children. Mm -hmm. And uh, there have been a series of quite scary reports on children and um, both in terms of transmission, but also in terms of these kind of mysterious ailments afflicting them. So would you just, you know, kick off with the, let's do the, the, the latter first in terms of the Kawasaki, whatever disease, analog and, and what you know, and, and, and then we can talk about transmission. Sure. We talked a little bit about this mysterious syndrome last week because there was that alert to the NHS providers and GPs um, early last week about this kind of mysterious cluster of kids who developed a multi-system inflammatory syndrome that made them quite sick, requiring intensive care. Inflammation around the heart, gastrointestinal symptoms, um, inflammation of the blood vessels, of vasculitis, and other kinds of things. And in most of those kids, they either tested positive for COVID-19 infection or had antibodies suggesting past infection. So what, it, what the suspicion is, is that this is a, an inflammatory syndrome that's post-infectious, meaning the infection triggers a kind of crazy inflammatory process in the body that, that can make you quite sick. And it's similar to something called Kawasaki's um, disease or a couple of other variants of that, which we don't totally understand, but we're pretty sure that all of them are post-infectious syndromes. Those might be after more run-of-the-mill viral infections and we don't totally understand what triggers them why it happens in some kids and others and usually the treatment for that is supportive care in hospital fluids oxygen etc and then sometimes anti-inflammatory medicines including sometimes steroids so that the number of cases of this has been relatively small but of course we weren't testing for it this is something that doctors noticed in icus we're seeing lots of cases like this there appears to be maybe a link to COVID-19, but there have been a couple of handfuls of cases here in the UK, elsewhere in Europe, and now this last week reports of, uh, I think a dozen or so in, in New York City. So it appears to be a thing. Um, of course, the jury's still out on exactly what, what that is, and I think a lot of research is underway right now. Um, and it's, it's notable because we've tended to think that kids are not spared from infection, but relatively spared from getting sick um, uh, when, they, when they get this, that most have mild or no symptoms. If you look at the biggest data set that we've seen, which comes from China's CDC, about 2,100 kids, that's true. But in, in kids under five and especially under one, there were already a good number of kids, close to 10%, who were requiring hospitalization. So it's not like kids are totally out of the woods and particularly infants and younger kids did seem susceptible to severe disease. This syndrome, um, the inflammatory syndrome, also tends to affect younger kids, usually, you know, around less than the age of eight or so. Um, so it's quite concerning, uh, obviously, because it's not acceptable in, in, in any kids. Overall, I think still more rare um, for kids to be as vulnerable to any kind of severe disease relative to adults, but it's non-zero. And what would be the things that would make you, I mean, obviously, of all the many things that this thing has been disastrous about, the one thing that everybody has been able to kind of clutch onto is, thank God it doesn't affect the kids. <laughs> so if that is something that people can't clutch onto anymore, even if it's just minuscule percentages in people's minds, you know, for, for parents, the one thing you don't gamble with is that. Um, but what would be the thing that would, you know, for you as a parent or, or, and for you as a parent who's also a healthcare professional and a public health expert, start getting it move, moving from it being a thing to being something that we need to start being very concerned about? I, you know, I don't know that this changes it for me so much because what we're talking about is a relatively small number still, right? So these, this is a really rare syndrome and we don't have exact figures, but even out of the population of all the children who have been infected, which we would just have to hypothesize because very few of them are getting tested. Um, this is still going to be a fraction of a percent of having, you know, the risk of this particular syndrome. So that doesn't necessarily change things for me either, but I have, you know, one kid under five. And so I know already that there is at least a, you know, 
five or so percent chance that if he were to get infected that he could have pretty severe course of disease. To me, that's enough to be concerned and be incredibly cautious about his safety. And that certainly factors into my thinking when we contemplate things like going back to school. So that's already something that absent some greater clarification and diagnostics around this, this, is, this will be something that starts factoring into people's considerations. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, I think today is going to be a, a, a tough conversation because <laughs> we're going to get on to the next, but so let, let's go somewhere good for a while. Remdesivir, Gilead, last time we spoke, there was, you, you were hinting at an inkling of good news based on the stock price. Gilead's um, trading had been temporarily interrupted. We now know that there's some promising results. Tell us, tell us about that. Yeah, so the um, the trial results were, were published a, a day or two after we spoke. And what it showed basically, this was the first kind of controlled trial where you're actually comparing a group of people who got remdesivir to a group of people who didn't, who should otherwise be similar. Now, small numbers, but that's what we call a randomized controlled trial. This is in patients who were severely ill with COVID-19, who were in ICUs and I think mostly on ventilators. And what they found in this study was a statistically significant difference in the time to recovery. So amongst those who recovered, those who got remdesivir recovered several days sort of sooner than others. So it appeared to shorten the course of disease. That's not an amazing, oh my gosh, outcome. It didn't necessarily prevent um, deaths, um, or, or, or it can't be necessarily seen as a cure. But there's actually, I think, a lot of positive news in that. One thing you have to remember is that by the time people get sick enough that they're in the ICU, they're so sick because of all the damage that's been done to their lungs. And, and this coronavirus causes, seems to cause more severe injury to the lungs than any other respiratory pathogen um, that, that I've encountered, right? People get really, it really hits your lungs hard. And we've seen people who even still feel good who have oxygen levels that are alarmingly low and still walkie-talkie. And by the time they get to the ICU, the damage has been done. Remdesivir is an antiviral agent. So you can start hitting the virus and slowing its reproduction, but the damage to the lungs has already been done. So what does that mean? It's probably going to be a lot more useful early in the course of disease before you have the lung damage, right? So if you have a lot of virus circulating in your system and in your lungs, and you're able to knock that back and begin the recovery before you have all of that damage done, that might make a really big difference. And some of my colleagues in uh, Boston, in fact, the infectious disease doctors who trained me have been using this experimentally. And um, I was speaking to one earlier um, and uh, you know, having, having used this in about 200 cases, they really feel like they're, at least anecdotally in that series, they're seeing a difference um, and that it makes sense to just give this to people with COVID-19, especially early on. And if you can, um, you can do that, there's a good chance it might help people to turn around before they get so, so sick. Um, so it's not a cure per se, but it might really, if we're able to give this in a widespread way, reduce the number of people who progress on to severe disease and then overall could reduce deaths. Should be um, noted that this is an intravenous drug, so you need an injection usually once a day for five days. This is not something you can pick up in a pharmacy and take at home. You have to sort of um, be in the hospital or in a place where you can get an infusion, so it's not going to be the sort of thing we're using in the community anytime soon, um, but it holds real promise, actually. I was a little more skeptical when I saw the data, but exploring this further and speaking to clinicians who are on the front lines um, uh, treating patients and using this stuff, I'm a little more optimistic that um, this could be an important tool for us. So two questions. One is, it's an antiretroviral. Antiviral, yeah. Anti antiviral. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and does that mean, well, are there any um, analogs to what we con are concerned about with antibiotics, which is overuse, promoting resistance? Uh, is there anything to be learned about what has been done with this in, in the HIV setting? Could you just use it sort of immediately you get it, everybody as a matter of course gets put onto it in order to do exactly what you, you said, sort of stop it getting to a more critical level? And would that be from a public health what are the downsides from 
for adopting that approach from a public health perspective? And might there be sort of, are there side effects on this where, you know, the, the medicine is worse than the cure in some instances? Uh, I'll, I'll do the second question first. For the side effects, the main things are liver toxicity, which is about 3% of people so far, to my knowledge. That's not insignificant. A lot of people with COVID-19 already come in with some degree of liver inflammation. So that's something that needs to be monitored carefully um, uh, and will be a contraindication for some, you know, some, some patients. And the second is kidney toxicity, which actually has more to do with the, um, the additive, the sort of fluid that the, the medicine is actually delivered in and that's something again that needs to be sort of managed and so in a hospital setting you would test for that stuff and decisions would be made um, you know sort of based on that so for most patients that's um, that's going to be a manageable sort of risk from what we've seen so far now as more people get this drug we certainly may see other side effects or toxicities we didn't know about that's what happens when you start to scale up the use of any kind of uh, vaccine or therapeutic so the first question around the potential for resistance, I don't actually really know the answer to that question. Um, what we know is the mechanism appears to slow replication of the, of the virus. Um, I, there are instances, you know, the, the, the processes by which um, pathogens develop resistance to antimicrobial agents sort of, you know, vary, but usually it's some version of you have a, you have a heterogeneous population of a, of a bacteria or pathogen in your body, you know, 99.999% of them might be susceptible, um, but that little fraction that's not, if the body doesn't happen to wipe them out, might then start to reproduce and you change your ecosystem so you have more of the resistant ones and then those can go on and infect somebody else. So I guess that's theoretically possible. To my knowledge, there's not been evidence of that. And at this early stage, we're talking about having no tools and we have one now that we think is a life-saving medicine. Um, I don't think that that hypothetical medical risk would give me any hesitation. I would rather get it to people who need it and study it really carefully. Two more questions. One is, how quickly can it be produced? Is it going to be schnaffled up in the US and hogged by Trump uh, and, and not be widely distributed? Can it be produced under license? When do we think it gets widely available? Um, and secondly, is there something about what we've learned about what remdesivir is in fact doing that may itself be a pathway to seeing what other clinical interventions or medicinal interventions may work as we know more about what stops or doesn't stop the virus. So Gilead has already been ramping up production in sort of in anticipation of this over the last at least several weeks. And I think their goal is to have, um, they were gonna donate enough um, uh, enough vials for 150,000 patients, I believe, in the U.S. I haven't heard about their pricing yet. I've sort of seen, I've seen ranges. You know, the recommendation from folks who focus on access to essential medicine suggested $10 a vial. The market suggested $3,500. Um, so somewhere in there. Um, it, it, so, so I think it, it kind of remains to be seen. Um, I would not be totally surprised to see some pressure from the Trump administration to try to keep this in the U.S. because that's their nationalistic way. Um, but there will be a ton of pressure, um, obviously, for that not to happen, pressure on Gilead and pressure on the U.S. administration were that to happen. One other important development this week that I think is worth highlighting was an announcement on Monday um, that was led by the EU and then heads of state from a number of European countries, Japan, Saudi Arabia, as well as the Gates Foundation and a few others, of uh, pledges totaling uh, about $8 billion for kind of a common pooled fund and a coordinating mechanism to fund vaccine development, drug development, um, and testing, and not just the kind of research and development, but also the capabilities to scale up manufacturing quickly, and then to ensure equitable distribution, so that when these things get out there, we have to understand that we got to work together to figure out where it's needed most first and try to get it there, wherever that happens to be. Um, there's a lot that's sort of unclear about that. We know they're not setting up a, a new body. Rather, it's a coordinating mechanism that's going to help direct this funding to the places it needs to go and, and try to promote the kind of cooperation we really need. 
Um, hopefully the money will follow through. We've seen lots of instances where countries make big pledges and don't actually deliver on that. Um, but it's a really exciting development um, because it's all focused on not only speeding up this kind of scientific Manhattan project um, to develop vaccines and treatments for the virus, but also explicitly with the recognition that this needs to be global cooperation. It should be noted that the U.S., along with Russia, were the notable absentees amongst G20 states who were not participating in, in that. And then the, the sorry, I, I always ask you two questions and you uh -huh. do such a good job on the first. The other one is just pathways. Does remdesivir contain any other breadcrumbs of where we could find possible treatments in it because we now know what might work? I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. That's yeah. what I look into and come back to you on. Um, okay, cool. The answer is maybe, and there's all kinds of stuff that we're learning, but I'm not. I'm not sure. That's okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, then um, vaccine. Um, any new news? You're in Oxford. Anything from there? And then the the Los Alamos um, piece of potentially worrying news. Tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, you know, vaccine-wise, the race it continues, um, and there's a lot that's ongoing. I've, you know, the the study here is enrolling, and that's good. I haven't heard of any problems, and probably at this stage, what you'd rather hear is no news. That just means that people are enrolling and things are going smoothly. If there was news in a trial early, it usually means that something bad happened, right? So, um, presumably, quiet means that. People are tolerating it and it's fine. We don't expect results for some months. Um, I haven't seen any other whiz bang big developments, good or bad on the vaccine front um, over the last several days to report. There was one report that's gotten a little bit of media attention that is a little bit concerning. I'm not sure if it's valid or not, so I don't wanna over worry all of you, but just to talk about what it is, there was a, a, a paper published that's not yet been peer reviewed, right? Normally scientific papers go through this process where a bunch of other experts in the field review it first and decide if it's good and give feedback and it's not published until it has that kind of rigorous scrutiny. Uh, a lot of that has been thrown by the wayside in the era of COVID-19, which is mostly good because we need speed and transparency of information to do that, but it does always create the risk that um, that bad science or incorrect science is going to sort of get out there and influence us um, uh, without those kinds of safeguards. So this um, a uh, group of scientists has been trying to track all of the different mutations of the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, to track. And what I had understood is that were three major strains that we've seen that have been called A, B, and C. Um, they reported in this manuscript uh, uh, that they've discovered about 14 different mutations and that there's one that appears to be um, quite significant in that it's a mutation that affects the the spike protein, the spiky part of the coronavirus that gives it its corona crown, which is what it uses to enter cells and sort of do its damage. And they say um, that they believe that that mutation allows the, that strain of virus to be more contagious than the other coronavirus strains. And what they've seen is that this appears to be becoming more common. So if you look at all the strains in a given place, more of them now are that mutated version than the other versions that we had seen before. The other kind of concerning thing about this, if true, is that the spike protein is this unique part of this coronavirus, which has been the target for a lot of the vaccine research, and we think also the kind of antibodies that might give you some immunity. So there's at least theoretically possible, if all this is true, that this mutated virus might mean that you could get reinfected if you had been infected with a different strain before, and it might mean that a lot of the vaccine targets that we're pursuing, including the Oxford one, might be less effective. Um, it's just one non-peer-reviewed paper. It's awfully scary to read, but I think we have to wait and see whether that's backed up with further evidence. Very, very, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> let's hope that when the peer review happens, it turns out to be junk science and fake news and we get to disregard it. But um, So, question to you about the UK. UK is now has the, you know, the great shame of being the largest mortality rate in Europe. Um, and nobody should take any, you know, glee in that to the contrary. But um, I think it does reinforce what you and many others have been saying from the beginning, how, how poorly this has been handled. There's nothing unique about the UK. This is stems from public policy. Um, so 
And, and then the second thing which I find interesting is that it seems that the plateau is quite, it's, it, it's proving to be pretty persistent as a plateau and we have not, we're not seeing the declines yet, which again may be because the, the early buildup was so badly managed. But just tell us a little bit about where you think we're at and what do you think that these latest figures should be telling us? Obviously a really grim milestone that we knew was coming. You know, all the trends were pointing that direction and, um, and it really is, um, uh, you know, really is devastating um, news to sort of to contemplate and, and to remember that the countries that were ahead in Europe in terms of the death toll had been hit earlier than the UK. So we had warning signs and, uh, and, and I wish we would have been able to heed them. Obviously we, we didn't and it, it just becomes increasingly clear that some of those early missteps um, really did sort of cost lives and, and paralyzed a lot of the response um, since. All that said, what's happening that's good. So you mentioned the plateau, relative plateau in the number of cases. If you look across over the last couple of weeks, we seem to be at somewhere around, you know, between three and 5,000 new cases reported per day. Now, testing has gone up, right? We know we've been wildly under testing this whole time. And so we're only scratching the surface in terms of capturing infections. So one thing that you might predict is that as you're testing, more people, and because we're only testing the people who are really likely to have it, because they're like in the hospital or they're health workers who are showing symptoms, right? The pre-test probability of a positive test is high. If you're going to increase the number of tests by 20%, you're going to start diagnosing more. So some of that plateau might be, oh, we're actually just capturing more because we're actually testing, right? If you look at the numbers of reported deaths, there does appear to be a fairly significant decline. So that did sort of peak plateau and has started to trail off over the last week or two. And the hospitalization numbers, which are not always reported, bear that out as well. So there, have been, there has been real evidence that this first wave of infections has peaked and declined. So we should always remember the number of reported cases is probably only 10 or 20% of the real total of people who have been infected. Um, so make that sort of what you will. It just means that using the number of new cases as a tool to make any useful sort of analysis, interpretation, or decisions is, is just not that useful. So we're kind of over the hump. We are maybe over the worst of it, but we're by no means out of the woods. And if you're still seeing um, 4,000 new cases a day and you anticipate that might mean that it's really 20,000 new cases a day across the country, that's a lot of active ongoing transmission that's still happening despite all the stuff that we're doing. So talking about ending lockdowns and starting to ease up um, uh, and have more mobility and things still is concerning um, to me because we know that there's a lot of ongoing transmission. And if the idea is when we talk about ending lockdowns, right, there's two ways to decrease the R or the R naught, that reproductive number, right? We want to get that below one. So on average, one infected person is infecting fewer than one other person. If we do nothing, it's three or three and a half or something like that. We've gotten it probably below one by all staying home and doing a really good job of that for a long time. As soon as we start moving again, that goes up, right? And we'll start seeing more infections unless we do something else to bring that down. That something else is doing that in a smart way. So maybe that is going into shops with masks and only you know, limiting the number of people in, having shields in workplaces, other things that are being talked about. But most importantly, it's about getting back to the public health basics of testing everybody who needs a test, getting infected people out of circulation quickly, tracing all of their contacts, and quarantining those patients who are contacts until you can be sure that they're not infected as well. Breaking those chains of transmissions is the other way to bring down the R. So if we ease lockdowns and we're not doing that other stuff well and effectively and at scale, then we risk seeing a, a second surge, which may not be evident right away, but will become evident weeks or months down the road. If you look at the kind of the, the five tests the government's laid out for their plan to reopen, they, they hit all the right notes. It's thorough and it's comprehensive and it's cautious as it should be, but the devil's in the details about how you do that and when you do that. And we've seen all kinds of wild talk about 
testing target. So it's 100,000. We met that. Okay, not really, because we mailed out 20,000 tests and then we counted them. And now yesterday, it's going to be 200,000 tests. I say garbage to all of that. To me, the metric is, if I need a test, can I get it? And I talked to two people today who have every symptom of coronavirus who sound pretty sick at home and they can't get a test, right? Unless they go out and find it privately because you still can't unless you're in the hospital, in a care home or a key worker. So we know we're not there. Um, there's talk of training an army of contact tracers. There's talk of the app, which is being trialed in the Isle of Wight. We need both of those. The app won't be enough. It'll be a useful tool, but you need thousands of people and shoe leather working hard to do the interviews and do all of this tracing. So there's talk about all that stuff, but we need to see that stuff in place. And if we're going to start going back to work and think about sending our kids back to school, you know, we don't want someone to get up in a press conference, the prime minister or anybody else, and say, okay, we're ready to start tomorrow. We need to understand how we're going to be able to do this safely and that we know they've got our back. So um, I'm hoping that we're going to start to see more and hear more detail about what that looks like. Um, it's been hinted that as early as Sunday, they may announce some easing of lockdowns, that they've started taking away the stay home mantra or the logo they're taking it off of their social media posts, whatever the heck that means. Um, I don't know what that first step is going to look like. Last thing I'll say, I'm sorry this was such a long answer. Mm. Um, everything we know about ending lockdowns or easing up on these extreme social distancing measures is that it's really fragile and it's really, really hard to do, right? You look at all the places in Asia who are way ahead of us, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, China, et cetera. You look at what's happening in um, European countries that have been starting. It's been really variable and it's been useful in a way to have all these different natural experiments. But look at Singapore, right? For weeks, I was coming here every week and saying, Singapore is the model. They've been surgical. They've done such a good job. They've had a massive spike in infections because they had a blind spot. They're vulnerable populations in, in dormitories, the migrant workers. Um, and, um, and that's exploded again. Japan and Hokkaido has gone into a second lockdown because of a new surge in infections. And those are places that were doing a lot more things right than we have been in the UK. So we just need to be really cautious about this. I know there's urgency, I know the economic situation sucks, but a second surge that happens early fall or even sooner would be so much worse. A second lockdown would be so much worse. So I just hope we can go really slow and be really careful and vigilant and have awesome surveillance, um, which we don't seem to have in place yet. So let me ask you just a parting question because um, people who are kind of, you know, stay at home, do it yourself geeks on the data. Where do you, what are your go-to three websites where if you want to really follow what's going on in the uh, in the uk death rates hospitalizations infection rates where, where what are the resources if people want to kind of educate and empower themselves with some degree of detail on on where where it is in, in their area or in london or in the uk as a whole so in general and I, you know i sort of scan the whole world um a, a little bit the two sites that i sort of reference every day at least as a starting point are the the johns hopkins covid 19 tracker website which um is 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 one of the most kind of reputed or up-to-date um uh, sort of representations of the numbers and has some really interesting um uh, you know, graphical trends and things like that. And then the second is, is, is Worldometer, which gives you a little bit more granularity country by country. Um, actually, then the third one is actually an Oxford-based project um, uh, that is called um, Our World in Data, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 Our World in Data. And they've got a great COVID-19 tracker that's looking a lot at testing in ways that other places aren't. So those are three good places to get snapshots of sort of numbers and figures and trends and things like that. In terms of other information and news, a lot of the mainstream media outlets in the UK and internationally have actually done a pretty good responsible job in reporting on this stuff, or at least really tried. We should recognize there's so much uncertainty, even in the scientific community, that it's actually really hard to do. Um, I really like a site called Stat News, which is a scientific um, news website. Um, so they know what they're doing. They're really on top of this stuff. They do a good job of actually translating some of the like medical and public health studies into language normal humans can understand. Um, and so that's a good site. 
Um, uh, another American site that I, I think has been really good has been The Atlantic, um, and that's kind of putting this whole thing in context. They've had really great um, reporting on this stuff. James, Ham James Hamblin is a doc who um, is a science writer and is amazing, uh, but there's been a number of really good things coming out of there. Um, in the UK, um, you know, I've been following all of it. The Economist has done some really good what does it all mean stuff as well. Um, uh, and, but again, the, the reputable sites are all, all sort of decent. That's kind of my basic daily digest. And then for me, I dig a lot, obviously, into the medical literature as well. That is an amazing resource. And uh, everybody should just uh, look at this, play it back when we post it onto our archive and, and take those notes. Peter, thank you very much. Uh, when I see you next, I would like the following please report back that the news on children is being sorted out. We know what it is. It's isolated. It's got nothing to do with COVID. Secondly, remdesivir is doing extraordinarily well, and there are lots of promise on that. And the Los Alamos board is junk science. Those three things would be very wonderful. <laughs> so consistent with accurate reporting, that's what I expect next time we chat. <laughs> <laughs> that and world peace, my friend. No problem. Exactly. Listen, thanks so much as always. Look forward to seeing you next week. And uh, Stay safe and stay well, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Peter. Ciao. Beautiful.